Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 6th of September, 2023. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So apologies for missing yesterday's episode, everyone. Just ran out of time to record one, uh, and today I'm recording it a little bit later than usual because I just got back from that meetup that I spoke about the other day, the Ethereum Melbourne meetup, which was really fun, by the way. A uh, lot smaller than the previous meetups that I had attended over the last few weeks, but still very fun. Uh, the main topic of the night was talking about liquid staking tokens or LSTs and just staking generally, restaking, a lot of interesting conversations around that. Uh, I did a AMA at the end of a presentation that uh, someone gave uh, around uh, RockX, which is a staking uh, platform uh, that has their own LST and They've been around for a little, little while now. They're also like a Lido node operator and stuff like that. So yeah, basically was doing an a, a co-AMA with him at the end of his talk uh, all about a staking, which is which is really, really fun there. But yeah, anyway, I'm back today. Got a bunch of things to get through. Uh, and apologies if I sound tired. I definitely am because <laughs> that meetup took a lot out of me. But I'm not going to miss another refill. I'm not going to bring the rug fuel back today. Uh, so let's get into it. All right, first, we have a very interesting post here from Danny Ryan. Uh, this is an ETH researched post called Peer DAS, a simpler DAS approach using battle-tested P2P components. Now, DAS stands for Data Availability Sampling, and this falls into the work around dank sharding. Not really specifically, I guess, like proto-dank sharding, more dank sharding generally, but it all falls into the same bucket at the end of the day. And this ETH research post talks about, uh, I guess, like networking uh, when it comes to, to data availability sampling and how that all plays a part, plays its part there. You can give this a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But this really is the next big body of work after 4844 goes live. I mean, there are uh, other things like 4844 plus, which actually that's a perfect segue quickly into uh, another thing that I was going to cover, which is a post from Terence, uh, who works at Pry Labs here, all around. Um, ideas around EIP 4844 uh, plus here and how that might work. But, but generally, the next few years will be focused on uh, dank sharding as kind of like the main scalability part of the Ethereum roadmap. And in that falls things like data availability sampling, uh, data availability schemes, uh, the, some of the schemes you've heard of before, uh, EIP 4844 plus, and on all, all these other things that basically make the uh, la layer one more scalable for uh, layer twos and for rollups specifically. Because Really, when it comes to data availability and and, and I guess like uh, increasing the amount of data the Ethereum Layer One chain can handle, that is really important for rollups. Now, if you're using Layer Two as the catch-all term for both rollups and like Validium type constructions that store their data off-chain, well then dank sharding is kind of irrelevant to them generally because if they're not storing the data on Ethereum, they're not going to be taking advantage of any of the dank sharding upgrades. Uh, at least that's that's from from my understanding uh, because they're storing their data on something like eigendata availability layer or avail or you know whatever else it is or maybe their own custom bespoke one but they're not storing it on Ethereum layer one, so they're not getting any benefit here. And I guess the whole idea around dank sharding is to make it so that Ethereum still can remain the most secure uh, and also one of the most, uh, one of the cheapest, maybe not the cheapest, but one of the most cheapest and reliable data availability layers. Because when it comes to data availability, it's all about uh, making sure that the data, data is available as possible, uh, is as um reliable as possible here. Now, if you rely on an external data availability network, that may not be uh, you know, very reliable compared to Ethereum L1. As we know, Ethereum L1 is incredibly reliable. It has an uptime of basically 100%. It actually has never gone down, right? Um, and it also has the utmost security that you're going to get out of any data availability layer. I mean, it has the most economic security by far out of any kind of L1 except Bitcoin, but obviously Bitcoin is, is not going to be a data availability layer for anything uh, anytime soon if ever. So yeah, dank sharding basically is all about making sure that we can scale that that data for these rollups. So uh, or I guess like layer twos generally, so they choose to store their data on Ethereum rather than sacrificing security and going elsewhere. And of course, this falls into the discussion around how much security do you need depending on what you are. For example, like a gaming chain may not need uh, Ethereum level security. And honestly, it may not even work on uh, being a rollup because it may require such ludicrous scale that uh, it's better suited to be something like a Validium, which, as I've mentioned before, is still a perfectly fine construction. It's just not technically a rollup. Uh, whereas something like a, a DeFi rollup or something that is home to a lot of DeFi apps will definitely want to be a rollup and to have their data stored on Ethereum L1. And the people using it would definitely like that to be the case for that ultimate, obviously, security and reliability for that data being available there. But 
Anyway, you can go check out the research post from Danny Ryan himself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. And you can also check out Terence's 4844 ideas and about how uh, 4844 plus ideas and how he's currently thinking about them. And the cool thing about 4844 plus is that uh, the constraint that uh, these ideas have that Terence gave is that they are additive, backward compatible, not consensus breaking, which means that would be no hard fork required. So if either of these ideas got implemented, they could be done at the client level and wouldn't need a hard fork uh, to to be kind of um to be uh, to be activated on the network, which is pretty cool, right? So yeah, you can go give those a read. I'll link them in the YouTube description below. All right, another bit of ETH research was posted today from Barnaby here called Fun and Games with Inclusion Lists. Now, of course, I've covered inclusion lists on the refill before. They're all about making it so that um, it basically becomes near impossible for censorship to occur on Ethereum. Uh, obviously, as it exists today, we have a bit of a hodgepodge of uh, of block building going on with the MEV boost network and the relays, which leads to censorship vectors. And obviously, the work around PBS and inclusion lists and things like that are aiming to rectify all of those issues. So if you want to learn more about uh, inclusion lists and some of the games that, oh, I guess, like theory theoretical games that Barnaby has played with them, you can give this ETH research um post the read because this is the sort of stuff that needs to be kind of thought through before these things can even be thought about uh, being implemented on the Ethereum network because at, at the end of the day if we implement something on the Ethereum network that is not resistant to an attack that basically kills the value prop of that upgrade well it doesn't actually help anyone right it just add, added more overhead uh, to the um, Ethereum governance added more overhead to the Ethereum core devs and, and researchers and in the end we got a worse result than what we were after so we want to thoroughly test these things and thoroughly research them before we even think about moving it on to creating an EIP about it and then uh, potentially getting it in, into the network. And as I've said before, all this stuff around PBS and inclusion lists, I, I, I would assume that it would probably be uh, be 2025 before we start seeing any of this stuff going live on the network. I feel like the EIPs for uh, next year, or at least the upgrades for next year's uh, network upgrades have already pretty much been I wouldn't say decided, but like soft kind of committed to. As I said before, Electra, which is the next upgrade coming uh, sometime in early next year after Denkun, uh, will include a lot of the EIPs that were pushed out from the three upgrades, the the Merge, um, Chapala, and Denkun. And then after that, we'll probably get some Verkle Tree related stuff, some statelessness related stuff. Uh, and then into 2025, it looks like potentially could be some PBS uh, stuff there. But yeah, we can go give this uh, research post a read from Barnaby. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, the ERC4337 Twitter account has... Eighteen teams have already begun building a variety of projects focused on ERC forty three thirty seven, which is an account abstraction related ERC here. And you can actually go and check out this list of of grantees, uh, and I'll link this in the YouTube description below. And they've got links to to what they're working on, how they're actually integrating ERC forty three thirty seven into their um, kind of products here. Uh, and it's really cool to see this because I think that. Obviously, account abstraction is a huge UX upgrade for for the, the entire Ethereum ecosystem, and we need to kind of just nudge it along at this point, and we need to make sure that people are building using a standard like ERC forty three thirty seven instead of going off into their own uh, different directions and kind of confusing things. So it's great to see that uh, these grants have been given out to these projects in order to keep them aligned on building around forty three thirty seven. So you can go check out this post. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, moving on. The Ethereum.org account uh, on, on Twitter here has tweeted saying, last month we wrapped up our first Translathon, a week-long online competition aiming to translate Ethereum.org's website in as many languages as possible. Now, I spoke about this a bunch of times on the refuel, and so here are the results. So there are the numbers here. Uh, there are uh, 621 registrations took place, 217 participants, individuals and teams, and 56 languages translated. Uh, and the most impressive milestone here is that 1.47 million words were translated uh, by the community here. And to give more context, the translation program was launched in 2019. And in 2022, the community altogether had translated 3 million words, meaning that in one week only, Translathon's participants got to translate almost what we could only achieve in six months. That is impressive. That is actually really, really impressive. And I'm great to, I'm very happy to see 
such success here from this program. Uh, and they've also broken down the top seven languages by activity, so by the amount of words that were translated. Uh, number one was Indonesian, uh, Turk, and then Turkish, Spanish, Polish, German, Russian, and Chinese traditional. Uh, Indonesian had almost 200,000 translated words, uh, and uh, Turkish at 167,000, and so on and so forth. You can check that out. I'll link in the YouTube description uh, below. Uh, and, it, and all of the uh, people that participated in this Transathon logged in from all corners of the world uh, to participate as well, which is really great to see. So yeah, this is this is honestly awesome. Uh, I'm I'm very glad to see that this went basically as good, uh, if not better than it could have gone. And I'm sure they're going to be running more of these transathons in the future. But as I said before, the Ethereum ecosystem obviously is very heavily English dominated, but Ethereum as a network is a global network. It should not be limited to only English speaking people. We should be able to translate everything in Ethereum into all the languages that we can, you know, as many languages as, as we can to cover as many people as we can because it's easy enough to say hey we're building a you know new financial system new coordination system in ethereum uh for the 8 billion plus people on planet earth but if we're only catering to english speaking people then uh we're essentially cutting out most of, of of the planet right so getting these translations done is critically important not just for ethereum.org but for the broader ecosystem so hopefully this can actually motivate some of the uh, broader ecosystem to run their own transathons in order to get their products and services is translated to languages other than English. All right, moving on. So node operator signups are now available on nodeset.io. So they say here, behind the scenes, we're working hard to increase earnings for Ethereum nodes. There are several opportunities in the works exclusively for node set operators. Uh, more importantly, by joining node set, operators can directly contribute to our core goals of promoting operator diversity, reducing asset concentration within and across protocols, and helping to scale projects that directly contribute to Ethereum's credible neutrality. So essentially, you can go to the site today, you can click, I need this decentralization or I'm a node operator. If you click, I need decentralization, you can safeguard your assets by distributing across a large set of independent operators. So you can stake with a large set of inter uh, operators here, or you can join node set as an operator uh, by clicking this button here and earn extra rewards. So each of these will take you to a Google form here, which you can see in front of me and you can fill this out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, but great to see more, I guess, like staking initiatives are going live here, staking services and pools and node operators going live here because as you guys know my general kind of view on uh distributing out and decentralizing the ETH stake, especially taking market share away from big players like Lido, is to just increase competition, increase education around that con co competition, uh, and also do you know tons of marketing around it to make sure people are, are aware of it. Uh, and there are not just kind of like marketing things that need to be done, there are also integration uh, related things. You know, it came to my attention recently, or was put back on my radar recently, that for the longest time, uh, Ledger Live only had uh, Lido as a as a uh, as a node operator that you could stake with, and a lot of people just defaulted to using Lido because they used Ledger Live with their Ledger where their assets were stored because they didn't want to move their assets, and Ledger just really made it really easy to go with Lido. Um, I think that Ledger is working on changing that uh, so that they can basically have more than just Lido there. They may even have more than Lido today, but I know originally they started with, with Lido. Uh, but those are the integrations that I'm talking about that are critically important. Getting that in front of people, especially people who are less tech savvy and aren't maybe crypto natives, because there's a lot of people who have assets stored on hardware wallets. And as I said, they don't want to move those assets off. But if they can, can uh, directly interact with them, um, with staking from Ledger Live without having to move their assets off uh, to another address or something like that. Obviously, when they stake, they're uh, you know if they they're depositing ETH, they're basically moving that ETH into into the Lido system, for example, uh, into the deposit contract. Uh, but uh, you know that's all happening in the background through Ledger Live. So these trusted kind of integrations are critically important to decentralizing and distributing out ETH stake. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see more of them coming online as time goes on. But you can go check out NodeSet for yourself. We'll link this in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so I came across this tweet from Stacey Murr talking all about the OP stack adoption. Now, there are so many chains building on OP or so many projects building an OP stack chain right now. It's pretty crazy. So the so you list out here the ones that are live on mainnet, testnet, and to be deployed. So right now, live on mainnet is obviously the OP mainnet, base, Zora, Avo, and the public goods network from Gitcoin. Uh, live on the testnet is OP BNB by Binance, um, which I believe is going to be settling to Binance chain, but uh, it may eventually settle to Ethereum. Uh, you have mode network here as well. 
uh, Unidex Finance, Kinto, and Manta Network. Um, I obviously don't endorse any of these myself because I haven't actually interacted with them and I don't know much about them. So just keep that in mind. And then to be deployed, we know that Salo is pivoting their L1 to an L2. Um, DBank. Uh, also, uh, he's, he's making their own L2. Uh, Maggie by or Maggi by A16Z, Lyra Finance, as I mentioned before, Lattice and uh, and 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 Clave here. So you can go check this tweet, uh, kind of like out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But the OP stack is growing. The I guess like app chain L2 app chain thesis is playing out here, and OP is at the forefront of it. So you can go check that out. We'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, I came across this tweet from Little Cohen here who talked about something you may you guys may not be aware of which is socket scan. So this is an the ether scan for bridges. Now I think I have uh, showcased this before on the refill, but what this does is it aggregates the data from native bridges and most third-party liquidity bridges like Hop, Stargate, and Across, and you can paste your address in and see all the bridge transfers you ever made in one place. Obviously, very, very cool and very useful for people who want to keep track of the bridge transactions that they've made and also potentially need to uh, get this data for tax-related purposes. Maybe you have done things through these bridges, like swapping assets and maybe EtherScan isn't showing you exactly what you need to know. So SocketScan will definitely show this for you. So you can go check this out for yourself. We'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so an interesting layer two project that I came across yesterday that I did some digging on because the, I recognize the name and there's an interesting story behind this. So um, this project introduced itself, it's called Layer N and they're billing themselves as Ethereum's financial layer. So uh, they, they, their spiel basically is that they are a financial network of hyper-performant ZK OP hybrid rollups. Yes, there's a lot of buzzwords there um, with native inter rollup messaging and shared liquidity, uh, modular ultra low fees, high throughput, less than 100 ms latency uh, layer n is built to scale DeFi on ethereum now you may be wondering okay this seems to have come out of nowhere and it's promising all these big things on ethereum uh what's the what's the gist here like what's the go what's the catch well the catch is is that layer n actually started out as a layer two on solana yes you heard that right a layer two on solana now of course we all know that solana doesn't really uh want layer twos or care for layer twos because solana as an ecosystem is trying to have that one single unified global states or basically be a monolithic architecture um as as, as, a, as a blockchain um but yeah they were going to build a layer two on solana now let's even funnier about this is that they uh, came out of stealth and announced their fundraise in November of 2022. And guess who they raised money from? It was FTX. <laughs> and of course, FTX blew up pretty much like very soon after they announced, I think. Um, and then also a couple of the... Um, the co-founders of Solana were also uh, investors in in this project because, as I said, it started off as a layer two on Solana. But it seems that they've been, I guess, like quietly building for the last seven or eight months and have exited Stealth again or kind of like reborn their protocol again as an Ethereum-based layer two. Now, this is not a roll-up. They're going to be storing their data on Eigen DA, so definitely not a full roll-up here. More of obviously a Validium construction. But if you go to their website, they make grand claims, and this is what kind of Look, I, I think it's cool what they're building, but I kind of, it, I, I wouldn't call it a red flag, but it's more of a, okay, they're promising all these things. Can they actually live up to it? Because if you scroll down a little bit, they, you know, they say here that they can do a hundred times the throughput of Solana. They can do it with less than 50 MS latency. Uh, and the cost per transaction is 0 0.01 cents. And they actually outline how they're achieving this here. They've got Ethereum as their settlement layer, Eigen data availability as the data availability layer, layer N sitting on top. And then they have these three products called the NEVM, which is just an EVM, uh, generalized EVM rollup. They have a DEX rollup, so a decentralized exchange rollup called Nord and Nord X, which is an institutional rollup. So yeah, as I said, a lot of buzzwords here, guys, a lot of stuff happening, a lot of big promises being made. But hey, if they're able to, I guess, deliver on these promises, then uh, that would be very cool because this is definitely Definitely something that I think uh, Ethereum uh, needs. It needs uh, a, a hyper performance kind of like financial layer where you could build stuff like central limit order books, for example. So clubs, as you may have heard about them before. And if it can be done in these kind of like promises of less than 50 MS latency, which by the way, guys, that, that is an insane, uh, I guess, like uh, latency there, less than 50, that, that's 50 milliseconds. So MS stands for milliseconds. That is an insane speed. Um, I think Solana touts, 
500 milliseconds um uh for for their leader to kind of like uh get a get a block out um and i obviously on ethereum it's 12 seconds <laughs> to, to, to uh, the, the latency to get a so per block right when the transaction has actually been processed it's 12 seconds on ethereum um but to get it down to less than 50 milliseconds We'll, we'll see about that. Uh, the cost per transaction is not really something that I, I'm going to ping because uh, if you're uh, if you're a Validium, then less than one cent is pretty easy to achieve. I mean, we're going to be able to achieve that as a roll-up post EIP 4844. But yeah, generally, as I said, a lot of buzzwords, a lot of promises being made. Going to monitor this, see how uh, things go with it, see how they evolve. Uh, but yeah, just something to keep an eye on uh, and a funny little story of how they came to be. All right, so Kane from Synthetics posted a blog post titled Synthetics, A New Hope, where he basically talks about uh, Synthetics V3 going forward, uh, their multi-chain plans, shared liquidity, uh, and and uh, what they're trying to achieve, all that sort of stuff. He also, I think, mentions in the post a possible... Um, uh, so, so a synthetics app chain as well, obviously built using the OP stack here. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in, in kind of like diving into the latest on the synthetics ecosystem, uh, this blog post is definitely one that you should check out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so Kevin Owookie, one of the original co-founders of Gitcoin, has announced his return to Gitcoin. So he says here, in his opinion, the DAO has made solid strides in decentralizing the tech, expanding the use cases, and exploring new growth areas. At the same time, I also think much of the community's criticism of Gitcoin is valid. Looking forward to turning the corner together with the ex existing team and the ecosystem. I'm interested in helping the DAO double down on what's working and figure out if how we can abandon what's not. I love this. I love this so much for a couple of reasons. First reason, I've said to you guys before that I think the most successful DAOs are going to be run like companies. They're going to be run with leadership, not necessarily being, being centralized, but with leadership and coordination. And who better to be a leader and be a coordinator than the one of the founders of Gitcoin and someone who deeply cares about public goods and advancing the Gitcoin mission. So I'm very happy that that Kevin has gone back because of that. And the, and the second thing is that I think that this sets kind of like a standard for project founders out there. You don't have to leave the project once you decentralize it or once you kind of like issue a token and create a DAO around it. You can stay on. It doesn't mean that the project is centralized around you. It means that you're staying on to guide the project, to coordinate, to lead the project uh, until you feel comfortable, I guess, like stepping down from that position. Because I think what a lot of founders do is that, that they... Uh, you know, decentralize their project out, they, they create a DAO, and then they say, well, okay, hands off from me for now, I want the DAO to, to evolve without me, blah, blah, blah. But that's not how it can actually work. What needs to happen is that the founder, the original core team needs to stay on to make that transition happen. It can't just happen overnight. And I understand there are some regulatory concerns as well, obviously, if there's a token involved, stuff like that, and liabilities and things like that. But... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that, that, that's that's on a case by case basis. I can't really comment too much on that. But generally, I do think that um, uh, Kevin coming back to Gitcoin is a huge positive for Gitcoin. And I know Gitcoin has had some missteps recently, especially with the shell thing and a few other things out there that kind of divided the community. So I think that uh, Kevin coming back should lead to a, a more steady state for Gitcoin and a uh, improvement in Gitcoin going forward. All right, so uh, last up here, DeFi Saver have introduced a new home for all your leveraged staking needs. So ETH, ETH Saver is a fully non-custodial app focused solely on leveraged staking and built on top of DeFi Saver. So the gist of it is that it keeps you in control. It's non-custodial. Uh, there's per user position, so no pooling of assets, which means no shared risk. Risk your choice of LST, lending protocol, and average level, and no withdrawal fees. So what the ETH Saver gives you uh, are the tools to efficiently manage these positions. As you can see here, uh, it gives you profit and loss tracking, liquidation risk data, and so much more. Now, you guys know that my general rule of thumb is that leverage is the killer. But honestly, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you are someone that can actually manage their risk, and, and you understand the difference between leveraging uh, leverage staking uh, and leveraging LSTs versus leveraging 
um, like uh, ETH and then borrowing stable coins and buying more ETH, like leverage trading, for example, uh, there are key differences there. Uh, I think they're important to understand. Then I think that this is a product for you. Inherently, there's nothing wrong with leverage staking. What Where it becomes like wrong or I guess uh, dangerous is when you try to do just degen stuff where you try to milk as much yield as you can out of it and don't care about your your you know you know your health factor or your your health factor or your liquidation risk and you just YOLO. That's obviously where it becomes dangerous. But that is true of pretty much everything in crypto, I think. So as long as you keep that in mind, as long as you keep that top of mind, I think you'll be okay. But definitely I think when it comes to leverage, I would say that leverage trading, as I just described, you know, putting your ETH up as collateral, borrowing stable coins, buying more ETH and then doing that, you know, in a circular way is definitely the most dangerous way of going about it especially if you're doing it on platforms which give you up to like 100x leverage and stuff like that. Yeah, that, that that's very dangerous. And I've seen multiple people blow themselves up like that. I mean, and we've even seen people blow themselves up on leverage in the crab market. I mean, just recently with that big dump that we saw uh, on BTC and ETH, uh, there was like a billion dollars of positions liquidated in 24 hours. What the hell? How, like, that's just crazy. Um, and, and you would expect these people to be people that like are uh, just in the ecosystem uh, and then and they've been in the ecosystem for quite a while. They're not actually noobs because all the retail investors are gone right now. But yeah, leverage is the killer, guys. It can kill you uh, and it can kill you fast. So just keep that in mind when looking into these products. But when it comes to leverage staking, there are a few other considerations here, but DeFi Saver has your back if that's something that you're interested in. So I'll link this in the YouTube description and you can go check it out. All right, last up here, I just wanted to give a shout out that tomorrow, or I guess like depending where you are in the world, uh, I'll be doing a Twitter Spaces all about uh, ETH staking with Etherfi. So uh, this is happening at 10 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, September 7th, which is 8 a.m. Eastern Time for those of you in the US. You can just go check out this link. I'll link it in the YouTube description below and set a reminder for this Twitter Spaces. And of course, it will be recorded uh, for you all to enjoy. But yeah, I'm very much looking forward to this. I, You guys know I love talking staking especially solo staking and everything that surrounds it there. And I, I think that this is going to uh, act as a really good opportunity to educate more people about solo staking in particular, uh, because I think solo staking obviously is critically important to the health of the network. I think it's only getting easier over time to do solo staking. Uh, and I think that we just need to educate more around that. So you can go check that out for yourself. I'll, uh, I'll link that in the YouTube description below. You can set a reminder as you've seen here, you know, you just have to click uh, on set reminder here and it'll automatically remind you when this goes live. I know this is, I think this is early for like, West Coast uh, US. I think this might be too early. It might be like 5 a.m. West Coast, but I think it's uh, the right time in in Europe and uh, East Coast here and in Asia. So covering most of the uh, of the globe there. And I think that the timing was was set because of that. They were trying to cover as many time zones as possible, especially because I'm in the worst time zone possible. That's why this is happening at 10 p.m. Because obviously doing it uh, you know, at any other time during the day for me, except late at night, it's probably not going to cover many people. But anyway, I'm rambling. I think that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow.